While in Bellingham, Washington, we stopped by the Watka Museum Old City Hall to learn about businessman J.J. Donovan's role in the growth of Bellingham from author, historian, and museum co-curator Brian Griffin. Our community of Bellingham, perched on the eastern edge of the Salish Sea, tucked into the very northwest corner of our nation, is not very old when compared to much of our world. But Bellingham's history is rich and varied. It wasn't very long ago that right here, where this grand old building stands, was the edge of a great wilderness forest of giant cedars, Sitka spruce, and Douglas fir, trees so old and so large that some of them were seedlings at the time of Christ. The primeval forest stretched from the salt water, where we are now, to the high alpine meadows surrounding the perennial snows of Mount Baker's volcanic peak to the east. It covered all of the present farmland that uh, stretches north to the Canadian border and beyond. And the early settlers thought that the timber would last forever. It's gone now sacrificed for what we have called progress. But a second and even a third growth is growing in our foothills, and in a sense those pioneers were right. The timber is lasting forever. Bellingham Bay was peopled only by the Aboriginal Native Americans, the Nooksacks, the Samish, the Lummi, those first nations with a common Salish tradition. They're still here now recapturing their old culture and working to protect this land and their treaty rights to benefit us all. The once forested wilderness that is now the city of Bellingham wasn't even a bona fide part of the United States until 1846. That was just 14 years before the Civil War. The British fur trading Hudson Bay Company on the Columbia River was the closest thing to civilization that this area could boast. All of the wild land north of California was by treaty jointly, and I should say uneasily, shared by Great Britain and the United States. But finally, in that year, 1846, the stalemate was ended. The two nations peacefully signed a treaty and agreed to divide this part of the world at the 49th parallel just 20 miles north of where I stand today. Now, for the first time, this area became a part of the United States, a part of the newly created Oregon Territory. That was just 14 years before the Great War between the states. Oh, the bay was called Bellingham Bay, all right, because late in the previous century, a few Spaniards and an Englishman or two had sailed through here looking for the fabled Northwest Passage, and one of them, George Vancouver, had charted the bay and named it after a British admiral who had provisioned his expedition, Lord William Bellingham. That year was 1792, and there were no white men living here then, nor were there any when the Oregon Treaty was signed in 1846. It would be 61 years after Vancouver's visit and six years after the land was divided that two white men were paddled into the bay by two Lummi Indians in a dugout canoe. That historic event, by the way, is celebrated in a totem carving that stands in front of our courthouse today. Our federal government sought to encourage settlement of these, their, this, their new territory, by enacting the Oregon Land Act of 1850. It offered almost free land to homesteaders, 160 acres to a single man, and twice that if you were married. The act achieved its purpose. Homesteaders began to come to Bellingham Bay. The first of them came in December of 1852 in that Indian canoe. Their names were Henry Roeder and Russell Peabody. They came to build a sawmill at the mouth of Whatcom Creek, attracted by the waterfall that still drops to the sea at the creek mouth. 1852, only 161 years ago. A few months later, they recruited Edward Eldridge and his wife, Teresa, to join them, and she became the first white woman to settle on the bay. 
Since that landing in 1852, through repeated cycles of boom and bust, of exuberant eras of lumber mills and logging, of coal mining and salmon canning and shipbuilding, and pulp and paper mills, the Bellingham of today has grown and prospered and changed to become the regional center for medical care, higher education, finance and technology production for the considerable population between two great cities, Seattle, 90 miles to the south, and Vancouver, Canada, 45 miles to the north. All cities grow and prosper because of visionary, hardworking, committed citizens. And over the years, Bellingham has surely had its share. And that brings us to the man that I would argue is the most important man in Bellingham history. 1888 was the year that he came to Bellingham Bay. And his is a great American story, a Horatio Alger sort of story, a story of the son of poor Irish immigrants who rose to great heights through determination, hard work, and sterling character. His is also a wonderful love story, a poor but hardworking Irish Catholic boy who fell in love with a New England Protestant whose prominent family had come to America in the 1600s. It took 12 years for their love to overcome the vast social and religious gaps that separated them. His name was John Joseph Donovan, but he was known by one and all as JJ. His story is told in the museum exhibit now showing in the galleries on the floor just below us. It is called The Treasures from the Trunk, the J.J. Donovan Story. I had the privilege of curating that exhibit, and I'd like to share some of the Donovan story with you now. Well, the Donovan story begins in 1845, when a terrible fungal blight struck the potato crop of Northern Europe. The potato had become the staple food that sustained the poor of Europe, especially the poor Catholic population of Ireland. Failure of the potato crop resulted in the deaths of a million Irish from starvation and disease. Another million immigrated, fleeing the horror, and no town in Ireland was harder hit than Skibbereen, the home of Patrick and Julia Donovan and their 11 children. Desperately, the Donovans saved their pennies, and by 1848, were able to buy a ticket on one of the immigration ships dubbed famine ships for their son Peter, aged 23. Peter Donovan landed in Boston and soon had a job as a laborer building the Boston, Concord, and Montreal Railroad up the western valley of New Hampshire. In two years, he saved enough money to buy passage for two of his siblings, Margaret, 19, and Patrick, age 20. They arrived in Boston in 1850. Patrick also got a job in the railroad, and Patrick eventually married a Julia O'Sullivan, and with her, moved to Rumney, New Hampshire. In 1858, their first child was born. They named him John Joseph. John Joseph Donovan, a young man destined for fame and fortune, who would have come to have a profound influence on our city of Bellingham. Young J.J. began writing diaries at the age of 13. They tell a fascinating story of an intelligent, hard-working boy growing up in the post-Civil War years, chopping wood for the fire, tending the family cattle, fishing in the rivers and ponds, berry picking in the woods. He excelled in his studies, and by age 19 had graduated from the Plymouth Normal School, certified as a teacher in the one-room schoolhouses of rural New Hampshire. Three years as a teacher convinced him that his long-held desire to become a civil engineer was a better life choice. And so with savings from summer work as a waiter at a summer resort in the White Mountains and with some help from the family, JJ enrolled in Worcester Polytechnic Institute of Worcester, Massachusetts. My East Coast friends tell me that I should pronounce that Worcester. Uh, 
In 1882, he graduated, a civil engineer and valedictorian of his class. He and a friend, Billy Barlow, were immediately hired by the Northern Pacific Railroad. The Northern Pacific was, at the time, building their railroad across the continent through the northern tier of states. They had started at both ends of the line, St. Paul, Minnesota on the east, Kalama, Washington Territory on the west. They'd been working at it for years. There was still a 400-mile uncompleted gap. Donovan and Barlow boarded the train in the east and rode to the end of track, which was at Pompey's Pillar in Montana. They then got off the train, boarded a stagecoach, and rode the final, uh, to ride the final 400 miles across the Continental Divide to Missoula. There they took up their job surveying and engineering the final 400 miles of the railroad across Montana. Well, the transcontinental line was finally completed and celebrated at a grand ceremony on September 8, 1883. Now the Northern Pacific decided to shorten its line by 100 miles by cutting their rail directly across the Cascade Mountains, thus avoiding the long journey down the Columbia River to Portland and then up to Puget Sound. Young Donovan did much of the engineering on that huge project. It took four years to build the rail from the Columbia River up and through the crest of the Cascades through a two-mile tunnel and down the west side to Tacoma and Puget Sound. For most of those miles and years, he worked with the railroad's prime contractor, a man named Nelson Bennett. The Cascade Division was completed in 1887, and Donovan went home to New Hampshire to end his 12-year courtship by marrying his Clara. In the meantime, Nelson Bennett, the contractor, had heard that a third transcontinental railroad, the Great Northern, would be crossing the Cascades at Sauk Pass, coming down at Cedro on the Skagit River. Cedro, now Cedro Woolley. He decided to become a city builder. He came to Fairhaven, the closest deep water port to Cedro, and negotiating with Dirty Dan Harris, he bought the town. He and his partner, C.X. Larrabee, also bought Bellingham. Bennett then hired our man Donovan to build a railroad from Cedro to Fairhaven and to be the chief engineer and planner of their new and larger town. J.J. came to Fairhaven, as he used to like to say, with a pack on his back, hiking the future railroad route from the Skagit River. It was July of 1888 and he'd left his bride, Clara, in a rented room in Tacoma as he surveyed the, the swamps and the forest that the railroad would traverse. That route is essentially the route now fo followed by the I-5 freeway. His letters to Clara state that there were 140 people in Fairhaven, perhaps 400 in aggregate in the towns around the bay. Two years later, the population of Fairhaven had soared to 7,000. The boom was on. J.J. and Clara soon moved to Fairhaven, 89 actually. He immersed himself in the life of this surging new city. He completed the railroad, the Fairhaven and Southern Railroad. He established Bennett's coal mine in, uh, near Cedro. He platted the now en enlarged city of Fairhaven. He served two terms on the first city council of Fairhaven. He designed the sewer system. He was an active stockholder in the water company that brought city water from Lake Padden and built the coal-operated electric plant. And he built a reputation of competence, energy, and good character that would bring him many further opportunities. In 1890, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace, a New Jersey Catholic order, sent two young nuns to Bellingham with orders to build a hospital. Without funds, armed only with their faith, Sister Teresa Moran and Sister Stanislaus Taihi turned to the most prominent Catholic in the community, Donovan. In 18, or he persuaded his employer, the Fairhaven Land Company, to give the sisters an entire city block high on the South Hill at 17th and Adams 
and he helped them raise the money to build the hospital. And within a year, the first St. Joseph Hospital opened its doors to serve the community. That fledgling hospital has grown over the years into Bellingham's second largest employer, Peace Health St. Joseph Medical Center, a first-class medical organization that serves the entire region. Donovan remained on its advisory board for most of the rest of his life, advising, raising money for, the free, for its frequent expansions, using his growing influence and means to assure the hospital's success. In 1889, a young man named Julius Blodell had moved to the booming Fairhaven and taken a job with Jim Wardner's Blue Canyon coal mine at the southern end of Lake Whatcom. Soon, Wardner and Blodell started the Fairhaven National Bank, and Blodell shifted to the banking business and became its president. Donovan was hired as general manager of the mine. Donovan and Blodell had an opportunity to buy the mine, and they turned to a man that Donovan had known in his Northern Pacific days in Montana. Peter Larson was quite a bit older than Donovan and Blodell and a great deal wealthier. The three bought the mine and formed a bond that would carry them into more, several more ventures crucial in the history of this city. As equal partners, they owned the coal mine. Then in 1891, inspired by the virgin timber around the lake, the partners formed the Lake Whatcom Logging Company. Now, needing to get both coal and logs to the salt water, they incorporated the Bellingham Bay and Eastern Railroad, and they built its rail along the lake's north shore to their coal and log bunker on the bay. That old railroad bed along the lake is now called the Ken Hertz Trail, a part of the county park system. Their coal bunker stuck out into the bay just north of where Boulevard Park ends now. Realizing that it was more profitable to sell sawn lumber than logs, they decided in 1902 to build a sawmill. The result was the huge lumber mill at the north end of Lake Whatcom, Larson Mill. The mill would operate until the early 1960s and become a foundation industry for this community. In 1913, Blodell and Donovan Recognizing the opportunities created by the opening of the Panama Canal, decided that they needed access to salt water. Larson had died in 1907. The surviving partners formed a new company, Blodell Donovan Lumber Mills. They purchased the old lumber mill of the Bellingham Bay Improvement Company on the salt water at the foot of Cornwall Avenue, and by 1928, they had grown it into the world's largest producing sawmill. They were sawing logs from Bloedel Donovan Lumber Company's timber holdings uh, in the Cascade foothills and on the Olympic Peninsula, and from logs purchased from the robust logging industry of this region. So for many years, the Larson Mill at the lake and the Bloedel Donovan Mill on the waterfront led the community in economic importance. As important as Donovan was to the economic and industrial life of this community, he was equally important as a community builder. He was one of the major proponents of the 1904 merger of the towns around the bay into the consolidated city that we now call Bellingham. After the citizens had voted to merge, Donovan spent countless hours on the citizens committee to develop the city's charter. It was Donovan who, in, in an op-ed article in the Bellingham Herald, encouraged the city to purchase the land along Whatcom Creek that would become Whatcom Falls Park. His thesis, great cities need great parks. It was Donovan who urged the city to build the boulevard around the steep State Street Hill that horse and wagons had difficulty climbing even in good weather. It was Donovan who served for eight years as a trustee of the then very young Bellingham Normal School, which would become the great cultural and economic engine of Bellingham of today, Western Washington University. It was Donovan who stood almost alone in opposition 
to the Ku Klux Klan's strength in this community during the 1920s. He was simply a man of incredible energy, vision, and community spirit who did much to establish the cultural and economic base from which this community has grown into the remarkable city that it is today. Donovan died in 1937 at the age of 78. The Bellingham Herald eulogized him by saying that Bellingham had lost its first citizen. From the 400 people when Donovan arrived, the city has grown to a population of 82,000, with another 120,000 souls in the former forest lands to the north and east. Much of our success as a community can be attributed to our quality of life. We enjoy rich cultural opportunities and remarkable beauty of mountains and sea. Living here is an ongoing pleasure. This community is proud of its historic past, pleased with its present, and determined to maintain our quality and livability for the future.